Hey, good morning. Scott Luton, Greg White with you here on Supply Chain. Now, welcome to today's live stream. It's the Supply Chain Buzz. Greg, how you doing? I'm buzzed. Yeah? No, not okay. at all, but I'm doing great. What a fantastic weekend weather-wise. How, how Midwestern am I talking about the weather first thing, right? <laughs> 77 degrees yesterday in the ATL. It was beautiful. Agreed. So there is hope. My wife and I went around the yard looking for buds and leaves and things like that, and they are there. So they are there for the taking. Spring has sprung. I was hoping you you were imbibing this morning because it's going to be a really lively live stream. So you let me down a little bit. But I don't drink nearly as much as people think I do. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so last night, Golden Globes, unbelievable. Borat beats Hamilton. And what I think what what Amanda has deemed one of the greatest upsets and travesties known known to the Hollywood Awards. So in mm. in, in two categories, nonetheless. So did, did you watch the Golden Globes, Greg? No. Never do. <laughs> never watch never watch movie award shows. Uh, all right. uh, but I heard there uh, I did see like a he cr brief headline that there were some Zoom fails. That's all I caught. What did something fail there were. with? Yes, yeah. too many to name. Wow. Uh, but hey, that that just that just makes me think that all those folks in Hollywood are just like us. All the rest of us at Murphy's Law interrupts our our daily connections via whatever platform. But nonetheless, uh, I know folks didn't show up here today to talk Hollywood and movies and whatnot. But it was fun to watch. Um, it's all about the buzz today. Every Monday, twelve noon Eastern time, uh, Greg and I jump on, and we oftentimes have wonderful guests like we have today two of our dearest friends to talk some of the leading supply chain and business stories across the global business community. So join us. And of course we've got our community. They always bring the, their a game already see some folks, some of the usual suspects in the comments from Gary and Jeffrey and David and Peter, uh, you name it. Lots of uh, a players there, Greg. And as a childhood member of the national organization for women, it is women's history month. So it is. I, I still have, my now t-shirt that I used to wear when my mom and grandmother would go to the, the rallies and things like that. Um, man, just met some amazing women. So I, you know, I was thinking about this whole history months thing and I'm thinking mm -hmm. wh what an incredible service that is to society to highlight last month, black history month, this week, women's history or this month, women's history month. We should have, more of those months or weeks or whatever to because i am just fascinated by you know of course i know a lot about this um this you know all the history of this month and of course last month but i was thinking about what are the months of interesting groups of people that we don't know about what is the mm. history that we might not know about excellent question great, great service to society absolutely and it was an interesting history lesson in terms of how it arrived at that the, the month of March and uh, too much to go into now, but I will tell you that. Did you know that today, 49 years ago, title nine passed by the Senate and it would become law not too long later and it prohibits sexual discrimination in all federally funded education programs. So that is a, um, a certainly a historical milestone. I looked at birthdays. Um, there wasn't a whole bunch uh, uh, there wasn't a whole bunch of historically, you know, big, uh, big names that you might could could uh, recall on March 1st. Uh, Kesha was born March 1st, Greg Kesha, as was uh, Catherine Bach, who played uh, uh, <laughs> Daisy Dukes on the Dukes of Hazard. Yeah, I was gonna say not our top female role models. <laughs> right. Well. I'm sure everybody uh, everybody can probably connect to both of those, the the musical artist and the, the television star. But nonetheless, look for a lot more programming here at Supply Chain now over the course of March as we continue to celebrate all the wonderful contributions. Way too many to uh, – way, way too much for a single month. But like Greg put, points out, it's neat to really focus on that for, you know, uh, over the course of a month. So a lot more to come. Speaking of learning opportunities, moving right along, this week, outstanding webinar with – the Reverse Logistics Association, Six River Systems, Dell, and Project Vert. Uh, there's going to be a panel discussion along, along with some great networking and a virtual site tour. But the panel is going to focus on creating a dynamic supply chain, one. Two, the role of WMS in reverse logistics. 
And three, perhaps the easiest case ever made, making the case for robots. So join us for this free event, March 3rd. You can still register. That's just a couple of days away. Um, and then finally, Gregory, Gregory yes, Scott sir. White. Uh, March 23rd. <laughs> You're in trouble, mister. Don't March also give my address, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. March, <laughs> March 20th. Social security number. March, <laughs> March 23rd. Uh, we're talking industry 4.0. Greg and I will be hosting our friends, Mike Lackey from uh, SAP Digital Supply Chain and uh, Tobias Hoffmeister with MHP Americas. So join us for that. That's going to be, you know, look, as we like to say, industry 4.0. Uh, don't call it a comeback. It's been here for years. It's been around forever, really. And, and there's some really creative applications, especially manufacturing, that we're going to be tackling in that session on the 23rd of March. Okay. Yeah. Greg, a um, lot too much to cover on this money. A lot of stuff going on here on the 1st of March. The Ides of March, right? Is that the first? Second is the Ides of March. The, the second. I don't know why. I, the second 16th. Is the Amanda's saying. Oh, the 16th. Nope, fifteenth. I'm hearing in my left ear. Fifteenth of March, the Ides of March. But well, you know what? Who should ask? Somebody tell me what Ides of March means. I used to know. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, well, Amanda, let's bring Amanda can clue us in on that. Yes. Maybe our guests know. Well, well they're not really guests. We got a four host show here today. That's right. So right? let's go ahead and, and welcome in our dear friends and, and fellow hosts, Corinne Bursa and Kelly Barner. Hey, hey, good morning, Kelly and Corinne. Hey, guys. Uh, and I'm so glad I don't know your middle initials or names or addresses because we have to give up ways to play. This feels like our management call, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, what do we want to talk about? Well, we got so we got we got a lot of good stuff to go into, and we've got we we love having mm -hmm. Kelly and Corinne join us here today. But you know what? We didn't have it done yet. We got to say hello to a few folks before we get started and dive into a really neat Wall Street Journal article. So let's do that. So Peter is with us here today. He says, "Here comes the Supply Chain Now Brain Trust." How about that, Peter? <laughs> yeah. Love it. Kavan, good morning, Kavan. Great to have you here. Kevin, great to have you via LinkedIn. David is with us now. David and I sat down for a little chat last week. And he is a great interview, and we're going to be releasing that this week. So, Dave, and hope this finds you well up in Canada. Jeffrey Miller is with us. Jeffrey, there he is. Uh, we were sitting down, Kelly and Corinne. Uh, Greg, Enrique, and I were sitting down with, with Jeff not too long ago. And the guy goes into, like, nuclear technology. I mean, I, he, he well, was, was like – that was when we were doing the headshots thing, right? Yes. I mean, six six just, pay grades yeah. over my head. But the just guy some light was, small talk. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what he does for small talk, right? <laughs> He's just that smart. So, yeah. Jeff, great to have you, have you here with us here. Uh, Peter says it's 8 degrees Celsius in Montreal. Sunny, awesome day. Tyson Steffens, the Palette Alliance. Peaches are close to bloom in my backyard with Tyson. Hey, don't hog them all. Send us some peaches, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great Which to see you. me of Sylvia Judy, right? <laughs> Imagine <laughs> what kind of jam we could funny. make out of those peaches, right? <laughs> hey, we did, maybe we Where'd need she to been? build a fruit supply chain, Greg. I have a whole marketplace. Mm. I'm willing to be I'm willing to be recipient and distributor. Okay. <laughs> Gary, great to have you here via Roslyn where the snow is melting. So good to mm. see you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Sadnand, and hopefully I've gotten that right. Great to have you here again. He was with us last week via LinkedIn. Anthony is with us uh, today. Good morning. Wafula and Elizabeth and AA. Good morning from sunny, warm Wichita. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Great to have you here. Okay. Go so, Shocks. AA. <laughs> so i've got a question before we get into our first story here today let me make sure that's teed up ready to go i'm working two mice today guys two mice how about that no i'm uh, <laughs> the appropriate term I, is nieces, Scott. <laughs> when i see one thing and when i see another thing but hey the odds of march i, I all i know is a phrase i can't remember I know it has something to do with caesar yeah julie um, assassination et tu brute Yes. Yes. What do we miss? Is that it? 
Yeah. That the whole story? Pretty much. That's pretty much it. That's when mm-hmm. it happened. That's, yeah. Did you do some Spoiler Googling, alert. Greg? Not a happy uh, ending. I looked, in the, I looked in the stream. Who clued us in here? Oh, it was it w- was probably Amanda. Ah. Or, or Clay. <laughs> Excellent. All right. We'll see. Think, Everybody... You know what I think I got confused by? My father-in-law's birthday is March 2nd, and we I think I may have jokingly <laughs> called it the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> well, Amanda says... That Romans considered it a date for settling debts too. Yes, That's probably yes. in the time that followed. So, yep. hopefully, no one's got any grudges here today that's going to settle those debts on this live stream. But um, we've got lots and lots to talk about, Kelly. And for starters, we are going to talk about folks spending money, which is a great thing. So, Kelly, who in the world is spending money right now? Well, right now. It's kind of a discussion about the question of deciding when it's time to spend money safely. Um, so I'm, I always advocate for people that you have to read. And I'm a religious Wall Street Journal reader. Um, so uh, it was either Friday or Saturday. Um, there was an article about companies starting to make the decision around whether it's time to make capital investments and whether it's time to start spending if they're in the services industry, which means hiring. So there's not going to be any clear signal about whether or not it's safe. The thing that I found was interesting were a couple of the numbers around not so much month over month. I think month over month, things continue to change very slightly, but year over year, at this point, we're still kind of going back to the very beginning of the pandemic. (laughs) And in, let's see, in January, um, Durable goods were 4.5 above where they were a year ago. Um, And services spending is going up as well. So I think companies are looking at the uncertainty and they're feeling the bullwhip and they're making the decision that even though it seems really scary, they can't pass up this opportunity Mm. to meet a little demand. And and that's going to require some investment. So it's going to be interesting to see what they actually do decide to do. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Uh, let's see here. Corinne, any comments? I, I do. Um, when you think about how many of the durable items, and, and that's one of the one of the areas that the article focused on, uh, we're very low in inventory. Scott, mm-hmm. as you and the Luton household can probably attest due to the whole dishwasher repair saga <laughs> that has taken place um, over as the pandemic rolled out um, on a global basis just long, long lead times. And so inventories are low or the inventory that's available is the wrong stuff at the wrong place. So I, I do think we'll see a bit of a bullwhip. We'll see some um, some demand uh, and orders from a uh, replenishment perspective that uh, the businesses are going to be stocking up. Yeah, agreed, Corinne. And, and you know, uh, Greg, I still notice as we you know, we get supplies here and there for AV needs, new shows, new series, you name it. There's still a lot of things that are out of inventory in there. You know, I, I guess I've been fortunate or I've just shopped for those shorter lead times, but I do see some, th- I mean, I, it hasn't impacted me other than forcing, I think forcing us to shop multiple places, but I do see that mm-hmm. significantly. And, and, you know, another thing I saw is um, what manufacturers, uh, are growing at their fastest pace since this pandemic started, right? Yeah. That was just reported by uh, in- Institute IS- for Supply Management, ISM. Yep. Yeah. ISM, yep. yep. Yeah. They've so, got a great monthly PMI report that comes out a lot of folks look at uh, each and every month. I think the question we have to ask there, is this a, tra- a leading or a trailing indicator from an, a, a purely economic standpoint? But certainly it's it goes to the point, Kelly, and Corinne were addressing earlier that that things are are picking up, whether that is to catch up or whether that is to get ahead or some semblance of both remains the question. Yeah, well said. Um, and to our uh, folks, our, our community and folks in the comments here, what are you seeing? What are you seeing from a, a business spending standpoint or as you're looking to acquire, whether it's cars or office materials, electronics, what are you seeing out there in the marketplace? We'd love to know. But uh, Kelly, great article here by Justin Lahart, I think it is, in the Wall Street Journal. So good stuff there. Uh, moving right along, I forgot what we're tackling next here. Oh, Coles. This, uh, this. Now, just to set the stage a bit, Corinne, I think you're going <laughs> to tee this up. Um, as I reached out to this, these three people that are much smarter and and uh, much smarter than I, 
what are we going to talk about on Monday in the Buzz? All three basically came mm -hmm. back with this story. So, Corinne, why don't you tee things up and, and tell us what, what's going on at Kohl's? Yeah, so this was fascinating. So this is from our friends at Supply Chain Dive. And I actually first read it when Greg White posted it at uh, the tail end of last week. And, and Greg was kidding with me that I responded almost immediately <laughs> to this post. But, but it I is, think we it, both felt pretty strongly about it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so Coles has an investor group that is proposing changes in the supply chain from sourcing and inventory to try to bring customers back into the store. So the first thing is that I am really impressed that this investor group is so supply chain savvy. I mean, that is fascinating to me and that they are active or activist enough to actually put out, if you will, some PR around their point of view. So um, the article covers huge, and I do mean huge investments that Kohl's has made over the last couple of years and very little to show for it. So they have invested between 2011 and 2019, I think is, is the range they shared, over $6.6 billion, with a B, wow. in capital expenditures. Um, so big dollars with not a lot to show from it. And, um, and I know that when we think about Kohl's or we think about fashion and soft goods, you know, there is art and science in merchandising but I don't think they're doing enough with the science piece of the equation. Mm. Excellent. Uh, so now that with that set up, Kelly, we're going to get your comments and then we're going to circle around to Greg. Kelly, what, what are you reading into this? To me, the story was, was interesting, ironically, for a completely different reason that it probably appealed to Greg and Corinne. I'm not used to seeing all that much discussion of, first of all, sourcing, right? Mm. But then indirect spend. So the fact that they called out not just the inventory that's being brought into stores, and that's really what that 20% about the, the third party group, that's really about merchandise that's being resold. But this investor group also wants them to attack their indirect spend. Um, so I've been, I've been teaching Greg about indirect spend from my perspective. <laughs> and so this is, if you're in the store, any products, any services, any consumables that are not being resold, it's plastic bags where they're allowed to use them. It's floor cleaning services. It's uh, shelves and racking. It's all of those right. other things. And so I find it interesting that this investor group understands that you can't just attack it through the merchandise. You have to look at the cost efficiency of how you're actually running the business. And one of the things that really jumped out at me from this article, it actually talks about the fact that Kohl's has not made any significant long-term purchase commitments. Now, I get that on the merchandising side, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be seasonable. You want to be flexible. But from an indirect perspective, you're literally mm -hmm. looking typically at economies of scale. And so the best way to get low prices is to consolidate your demand and make commitments to those suppliers. So maybe that's a strategy they end up looking to address. But I loved the fact that the investor group understood the power of mm. what you can achieve at the bottom line through indirects. Well said. And Greg, all right, let us have it. The, well, the, uh, um, yeah, ahead. this will probably come as a shock to Kelly, but that was the <laughs> first thing that I noticed was, the, sorry, I just, I was so enthusiastic. I just made my mic off. Um, the, um, the, juxtaposition of t in in two mm -hmm. measures one the juxtaposition mm -hmm. of um of procurement and purchasing and the confusion of purchasing yeah. and purchasing and procurement which you both of you karen and kelly probably saw in this article mm -hmm. but yes the, the fact that one of the things that they called out was um they're spending by estimation of the investor group 20 percent more Mm -hmm. than they should be spending in their procurement operations. Um, and you know, we've been talking about GPOs and things like that for weeks on yes. end and the value of that. And they've been flying solo and clearly spending too much on that. Their margin has been declining since 2011, two and a half points, in fact, um, since 2000, just from 2011 to 2019. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't count the impact that 2020 
had on it. Yeah. And the complete lack of accountability for, as Corinne alluded to, some of these relationships, inclusive of the Amazon returns relationship, mm -hmm. which management continues to state is accretive. That's the specific word they use. But the investors found little to no evidence to support that statement. Mm -hmm. And I think we, you know, we've been talking about this for months. And I think that um, that's another one of those things where we suspected that that might not get them necessarily the results that they wanted. Here's the thing that I, I, I saw and I was very pleased by one. Um, I, I was pleased by the fact that they recognize that the board has not uh, effectively been able to guide Michelle Gass, their relatively mm -hmm. new CEO, who clearly, I mean, when you look at her, her, um, her uh, provenance, she, she, yeah, she's got, thank you. <laughs> she's got, she's got the wherewithal to do this, right? But the board in the, these active investors opinion has not been doing their job to, uh, you know, address accountability, to address the financials. And they want to put board members in place who know supply chain, who know procurement, who know retail, who mm -hmm. can help management to position some of those um, opportunities because they are there 2.7 billion mm -hmm. of the 6.6 .6 billion that Corinne was, was talking about is on technology. Mm -hmm. um, so you should be seeing some results. Uh, let's, I mean, let's take target as, as an alternate case target who spent mm -hmm. 4.4 4 billion in technology is seeing substantial results and Cole's, in a slightly different market space has the same opportunity to, to move themselves up in the market, whatever it is. And this investor group did the same thing at Bed Bath & Beyond, I think it said. They, yes, that's they right. got rid of the board, brought in yep. a new board. Um, yeah, and I think, the, I think the, the timing is right, the opportunity is right. And the good news is they've got leadership in place that both will listen to the board and can execute when they get good direction. Mm. Yeah. I, 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 um, I can't say I've ever been into a Coles and shopped, but, um, Oh so my gosh. Yes. Yeah, kind of, maybe I'm the only, maybe I'm, <laughs> I'm the weird one here, but I'll tell you, that's where, that's where my daughters learned how to bargain shop. Really? <laughs> um, yes. the Amazon relationship is so interesting. It'd be, it'd be so neat to see if they could somehow, uh, for every, every, all the foot traffic that comes in there and drops off returns, if they could, track to see what they're spending while they're still there in the store or if they're just dropping off that return uh, because it's yeah. convenient. That's an interesting comment there, Greg, and all of y'all. Well, you know, particularly with the news about Belk, who went B BK last <laughs> week, yep. um, you know, that maybe that's, I don't know, Corinne and Kelly, I don't know if that's kind of what ignited your interest, but I think subconsciously, at least, I put Coles and Belk in a very similar category. And I think um, something needs to be done for some of these quality retailers mm -hmm. yeah. that that need some guidance to get themselves to the next level. And nice. I'm glad to see yeah. that, I'm glad to see the collaboration there. Well, they certainly won't be the first nor the last um, uh, board uh, looking for more supply chain. Been there, done the expertise uh, across the board, and of course, return on gosh, a six point six billion dollar. <laughs> Uh, investment. So, uh, looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Let's let's share a few comments before we move right along from our audience here. I think Gary's coined a new new word here, Amber <laughs> Maestress. Uh, I think referring to you. Oh, no. a, couple of, oh. a couple of Mises. Uh, T squared. <laughs> going back to our peaches, mm. uh, uh, food, glorious food, mm. all in the supply mm. chain context. That's one of my favorite examples of supply <laughs> chain for sure. So this goes back, Jeff's commenting, uh, kind of going back on, mm. on spending money. Jeff agrees with Kelly. A notable amount of today's CapEx investments are for risk hedging. Mm -hmm. If inflation remains low and the Fed continues to buy, the economy will grow. No manufacturer or service provider can afford to be left behind for want of capacity and capability. I think this is reactive, not leading. Mm. Man, Jeff, you, you got a way of... Kelly? I'm curious. So... Obviously, I agree with him agreeing with me. Well done, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. Thank you. Um, the thing that's actually really interesting to me about this, and, and this is a so a B2B scenario, 
when I think about capital expenditures from a procurement perspective, the thing that's always sort of the fly in the ointment is the fact that most companies recognize the savings associated with the contract over the same schedule that they will depreciate those goods or facilities or whatever it happens to be. And so you can work your tail off and save millions and millions and millions. But if you have to divide the recognition of those millions of dollars worth of savings out over the, let's say, 30 years of the depreciation schedule, it's a little bit of a disincentive from a yeah. procurement perspective. It's it's very frustrating. You get to take like a tiny little fraction every year for 30 years, like in 30 years, who even cares anymore? And it's not <laughs> that it has to be the exact same amount every year, right? That's up to the, the accounting group at the company, but it's... They're complex contracts. There is a lot of risk because you do need to make a commitment. It's not the same thing as trying to anticipate your demand on widgets or consumable supplies, right? It's it's big, scary, short-term spend outlays with, from a procurement perspective, you know, kind of sort of a reward over a very long time. It's frustrating. Mm. Um, all right. Good stuff there from Jeff and from Kelly. Let's just keep moving right along. Abrana says, as a procurement officer, he's seen delays in supplier delivery. Agreed. Mm. I think a lot of us are seeing those. Uh, Abrana. Uh, Samson is uh, tuned in via Nigeria, via LinkedIn. Great to see you. Uh, Andrea, who is <laughs> sisters to <laughs> Sophia Rivas Herrera. And by twin the way, sister. So she is an ad, she's a perfect stand in. <laughs> right. And. Uh, one thing that you may or may not know about Sophia is today we launched Supply Chain Now in Espanol, right? You, you can find the first episode on the main channel, right? Wherever you find your podcast from. Well, Sophia was a co-host with Enrique Alvarez as they uh, interviewed Josuea with uh, MIT. Great discussion. I, you know, especially as I'm piecing together my my um, uh, Spanish speaking and, and comprehension ability. But excellent and great to have you here. Andrea, please tell Sophia, who I bet is tied up in her new role, Greg, uh, please make sure you say hello for us. Uh, let's see here. T-Square, who holds down the YouTube fort for us, says reading the story was a jolt in a good way, but it's good to see supply chain be viewed as something other than an afterthought. Excellent. Mm. Let's see, David says, it's a great question. How much residual shopping is that going to generate? Talking about, of course, Kohl's and, mm. and Amazon's relationship there. Peter says cost benefit analysis with MPV is very complex. I bet Peter and Jeff could figure it out. Peter, Jeff, <laughs> and Kelly. And Kelly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. All right. Kelly, that is somebody, I don't know how much you've talked to Peter, but I, I had a discussion with him on Friday. Peter and when I have spoken. Procurement, Hi, Peter. He gets above my head almost as fast as you do. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you two could have a really, really productive conversation. I agree. Um, all right. So again, we've been talking about over the last few minutes here, this article in Supply Chain Dive that A.B. Brown uh, put together. And by the way, we've yep. been featuring a lot of A.B. Brown's work here uh, lately. So keep up the great stuff there at Supply Chain Dive. Now, next up, Corinne, we're going to be talking about the Gartner Magic Quadrant for yes. Supply Chain Planning Solutions. So hey, go slow so that I can keep up with the rest of y'all, okay? <laughs> wow, this is, this is one that I know for sure Greg and I could probably do at least a half a day on. So um, we'll, we'll just hit the, the highlights here. But Gartner finally published its Magic Quadrant for Supply Chain Planning. So it published last week. And if you're not familiar with the Gartner Magic Quadrant format, it is um, uh, their signature report structure. And this particular one on supply chain planning is probably the most influential report in the marketplace when it comes to leveraging technology to drive supply chain performance. So love it or hate it, this Gartner supply chain planning magic quadrant has influence. And kudos to Amber Sally, who led the research with the Gartner team members, Tim Payne, and Pia Lund on finally getting this thing out the door. Um, it, like our businesses, was impacted by COVID as well. Mm. And um, the criteria is pretty comprehensive. So it employs 15 critical capabilities, Gartner calls it, across five stages of process maturity, 
And then the solution partners have to actually demonstrate five different scenarios as a part of the analysis. So when it comes to industry analysts, it probably has more rigor behind it. Not probably, it definitely has more rigor behind it than many of the reports that are in the marketplace. But there's still a little twist of magic that happens. <laughs> um, so the, the solution providers get, get rated and scored in this quadrant format. So what you're seeing here is not the actual report, but it lists for you what those four quadrants are. And as you can imagine, you want to be in the upper right-hand corner, right, in the leader's quadrant. But there are some outstanding solutions in the challenger's quadrant and in the visionary's quadrant and even in the niche quadrant. So there are uh, this year 18 solution providers, 18. There was another 10 solution providers that got honorable mentions hmm. um, in it. And I can tell you for sure there's at least another 10 that wish they were in the report in some form or fashion. But, I can name um, one. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's, it's, that, um, I think the one that you would name is actually in the honorable mentions yeah. um, as a part of that. But um, it is an honor to be on the quadrant. So congratulations to the 18 solution providers who are represented on the 2021 um, Magic Quadrant. Um, and then there's kind of a mix of feedback and, and, uh, and emotions, as you can imagine, all around it. So as challenging as it is for the analyst to do the analysis, I will tell you, as a solution provider, it's a whole lot of work to participate it, in this. Yeah. It's rigorous. No it doubt. is rigorous. Yep. So, yep. Greg, any additional commentary there? Yeah, I mean, there is one notable absence, and it's frankly very disappointing to me. I won't name it, but I bet if you look at my profile, you can guess who it is. Um, <laughs> um, and I can only guess, I can't even guess why that could have happened, and I'm on the board of directors. So, um, that, you know, so the, I think the important thing that Corinne uh, discussed with this is you don't necessarily go to the leader's quadrant to select your mm -hmm. application. Um, as you can see here, SAP, well, you can't see here, but you can see in the quadrant, <laughs> SAP slipped Careful. out of the leader's quadrant because, and I think this is a, yep. this is a really, um, this is a really encouraging tendency that started back in 2013. Tim Payne, when he was still running this, had mm -hmm. a very uh, distinct initiative to make sure that we weren't just shoving the old guard into the, let's see, into the leader's quadrant right? But really challenging companies to be doing something innovative or new uh, more than just having a lot of customers and more than just having broad-based solutions, but really impactful and innovative and sometimes even disruptive solutions. So um, if you're looking for, depending on who you're looking for, I'm looking at the names in this right now, and I can't see one company that you should not do business with. Mm. A lot of it has to do with the size and scale and the, and the, rapidity of growth of your company. And some of it has to do with the specific segments of supply chain planning that you exactly. want to do, right? Karen? Exactly, exactly. And and we should mention, Greg, that the the functional analysis for this report was done at the tail end of 2019. Mm -hmm. So I think that all of that research um, completed in December of 2019. So here mm -hmm. we are you know, this published in February of 2021. So that gives you just a feel we were talking about bullwhip effect before. Yes. We, we may be seeing a little bit of bullwhip effect here because I guarantee you that the market did not stand still last year. That uh, as you know, a number of companies have been investing heavily in, in um, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and new analytic capabilities, pricing right. as, a, as a factor. So lots and lots of new capabilities in the market um, but the other thing that impacted this particular magic quadrant was customer references. So that customer reference process was kicking off just as COVID hit. So in the February timeframe and early March timeframe. Um, and, and you can imagine as those executives were scrambling to take care of their people, to take care of their customers, 
to look at alternate plans for their businesses, some of those um, customer references didn't take place. Mm. And, uh, and Gartner pushed forward uh, without those references. And they are very influential. So customer yeah. success is very influential in yep. the overall plotting of the outcome here. Um, Greg, you mentioned something, though, that is worth mentioning. And this is the first time that I am aware of that the leader's quadrant does not include a single ERP provider. Hmm. So well, arguably maybe blue yonder is retail ERP, but, but to the point that you're making, Corinne, the leader's quadrant used to be ERP is typically a manufacturing, at least at its core, it's a manufacturing based yeah. solution. And, and, as we've seen frequently, the manufacturing disciplines of supply chain are often projected on the rest of supply chain. And those don't always, well, they don't ever work outside of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. The supply chain, when it when you get to the distribution and the retail level, it, the methodologies, the dynamics and the execution models are distinctly different. And I think yeah. we're starting to see some specialists mm -hmm. uh, come to the fore. Right. Because yep. even if you have SAP and Oracle, you still need to bolt something else on if you have retail, e com, distribution type uh, business entities. Yep. And years and years ago, Gartner actually tried to do the magic quadrant for distribution centric businesses, manufacturing centric businesses. Yeah. But I, I think it just doubled or tripled the workload. And so they went back to one. Um, magic Quadrant. And by the way, this particular Magic Quadrant combines the criteria for what used to be the supply chain planning and the sales and operations planning. So the criteria uh, was mixed okay. and, and weighted differently this time around. So they actually consider this a brand new Magic Quadrant, even though it's named the same thing as, as yeah. one that published in 2018. I'd love to know the history behind the name Magic Quadrant. Uh, Talk about magic something. in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, so, Gideon, anything to do Gideon. with Gartner, Gideon is behind yes. the magic for Yes. Yeah. By the way, uh, so we've got a, a couple of great questions here, and, and, and we're going to start with Tyson, and then we're going to circle back to Peter. So Tyson kind of has a more of, of a, a general question here. I'd love to get you all to weigh in on. He says he's not strong in this space, but wonder, has anyone ever tackled planning and future developed based on excelling with stagnant growth? It is insane capital letters insane to assume everything will always get bigger. If we can't excel without growing and consuming, we are all doomed. Who are going to, uh, who are going to the leaders to show us how to stagnate and crush it? Interesting question from Tyson. Anyone, any, any. So I'm going to, I'm going to answer from a technology solution provider perspective. Um, and I know Greg will probably have a, have a perspective on this as well, but um the expectation is that if your solution is driving value, your business should be growing exponentially, double digits. Um, I can tell you, I remember having a meeting with, with financial investors probably 12 years ago now, and them sitting across the table from me telling me, you guys are not losing enough money, right? You're, you're too profitable. You're not losing enough money. And their point was that we needed to pour even more money back into the business through acquisitions or growth or, you know, unnatural acts, if you will, to, um, to not do a sustainable, um, well-regarded, financially, fiscally responsible growth trajectory, but to do a huge, you know, um, exponential growth plan for the business. Mm. Greg? Greg? Businesses that are stagnant or markets that are stagnant have to generate cash, a ton of cash and yep. profit. So they become, they become, um, well, frankly, that becomes kind of the area that Kelly deals with. How can we take cost out of mm. the, out of the infrastructure, out of the back line, out of the bottom, uh, you know, out of the uh, expense line and create profit out of a stagnant or dying businesses. Companies do it all the time, Corinne, even in yep. technology. They yep. buy businesses for their current customer base and they just bleed them till they're dry, till those yep. all those customers go off to a new technology. 
So it can be done. Um, and there are models for planning for that. They're mostly financial models. Kelly, I, I don't know if you've experienced this, but they're mostly financial models. And they're usually, usually the financial model of a private equity group who specializes in bleep. I don't know how else to say it, gang. Bleep <laughs> company, right? I mean, Kelly, tell us, you must have seen that in your years. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're stagnant and you're literally just trying to get out costs, um, I mean, there's, there's only a few ways to do it. You either minimize or rationalize demand. So you don't buy anything you don't absolutely have to. You can, I mean, assuming your volume's already consolidated, you can try to simplify or pick a common spec. Um, but truthfully, I think the bigger thing yeah. that more and more companies are figuring out to do is to get stuff off their own books and have somebody else do it. And sometimes it looks like traditional outsourcing. Um, other times it, it doesn't, it ends up taking a slightly different form than that. But I mean, you do get to the point where there's only so much more you can do to reduce costs and protect the bottom line without actually continuing to drag yourself down. There is right. a point beyond which you, you know, you just can't save anymore. Can't slash your way to growth oftentimes. Um, That's right. All right. So I want to pose Peter. Peter's got an interesting question I'll, I'll pose to the group here, but really quick, I uh, did, did some quick Googling. According to CIO index, the term magic quadrant was first used in public by Gartner in 1994, mm -hmm. but its history goes back to the 80s when it was meant as a quick overview to a market mm -hmm. segment. But I like uh, Simon's got an early edge for comment of the day. <laughs> magic quadrant with lots of currency in the, in the well, that's pretty much why companies want to be in it. Yeah, right? it, it is. It, it is. Yeah. It is a broad market validation. Gartner is, you know, we talked to Mike Griswold, who has managed to avoid um, having his own magic quadrant, and because I think he, I mean, he, I don't know if he'd ever say this, but I think he has enough work working directly with clients. Um, and this is an incredible amount of work, crushing amount of work, right? Um, and I'm glad that Tim and Amber have have teamed up, um, you know, to, to make this thing happen, because it was a crushing amount of work for both of them. And um, it, it is by far the most, it's, it's the most objective that I think an, an analysis group could make it. You can't buy your way in and you can't buy your way to the top, regardless of what people think you mm -hmm. can't. Um, that's not to say that there isn't some additional influence for being a big yeah. player in the marketplace, but I think you can see in this one in particular, I mean, if anyone could have bought their way to the top, it would be SAP. And mm -hmm. I think that really, by the way, goes to the integrity mm -hmm. of this magic quadrant as well. And now what used to be called the magic quadrant in the eighties, now they call a market a hype they have hype cycles and they have a market yeah market scape market scape yeah market, yeah market scape. yeah love it yeah. all right so let's pose this question from peter and peter's referencing and we'll pull up the image again here in, in a minute uh corinne we'll start with you what he find or, or this is peter's words what i find is the solutions are placed in generic evaluation quadrants and you really need to evaluate on a project per project basis, or perhaps am I missing the point of the last chart? Corinne. So uh, Peter, you're not missing the point of the chart. Um, the challenge becomes that many just look at the chart and circle those that are in the leaders and go from there. They don't yeah. look at what Greg was saying about the type of business, the scope, the maturity of their user community. Um, and it, it sometimes eliminates solutions that would actually be better suited for their businesses. So this particular 2021 chart has five solution providers in the leaders quadrant, five in the challengers quadrant, four in the visionaries quadrant, and four in the niche players. Um, and so it is a little more balanced than it has been in the past, which is interesting. Um, but, um, but what you're getting at, Peter, is you have to look at your use cases. You have to understand your business and what's going to work inside your ecosystem to drive those tangible results. Well said. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, this has been fascinating. A, a quick question for you both. H how many 
categories are there? Is there a ma is, it's clearly this is the magic quadrant for supply chain planning solutions? How many other quadrants are there? Oh, I don't yeah. know the exact number, but it's yeah. 10 or 15. I mean, you, really? you, there's a magic quadrant for like cloud services. Yep. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, there are magic quadrant. Uh, is there a magic quadrant for procurement tech, Kelly, or something oh. of the like? Yeah, no, yeah. there absolutely yeah. is. And CRM. We should do that and, one next. You know, and I can just yeah. sit here silently and watch Kelly. <laughs> I'll tell you. Maybe, maybe we should come up with an, an <laughs> enlightened grid. And, and we'll run, run a campaign behind it. Get that? There, there are there are other analyst groups who do a similar thing. It's not nearly as rigorous, but yep. um, the MQ there are a lot of it. similar type uh, applications out there. All right. Um, fascinating. I appreciate that um, in-depth report on the Magic Quadrant, uh, especially from a supply chain planning solutions. A uh, ton of work. It, man, if... Uh, I could feel the work that goes into that just over the last 10 minutes. I can't imagine all the data and, and uh, reporting that must be crunched. Um, and, and it's emotional. It's one of those that is emotional. I mean, you, you work hard to represent the solution capabilities as well as possible. And, and um, you know, and, and you don't have the opportunity to see what the competition is doing. So um, you could learn a lot if you got to see everybody's and, you know, plus up your message. But uh, it's a lot of work for the analyst. It's a lot of work for the solution providers. Mm -hmm. So one final question here, and then we're going to move on to a, one of my favorite stories because I'm a big space nerd and I love great examples of leadership too. Uh, and when it gets recognized, but really one last question, because I think, uh, and Kelly, may, maybe you too, but I think Greg and Corinne both have been with, with companies that have been recognized with that magic quadrant. Yep. And and Corinne was just talking about how it's it's a it's you it's something you celebrate. Uh, so can you in a very small nutshell, mm -hmm. Corinne, what'd y'all do when when last time uh, an organization you're with uh, received that recognition? How, what did y'all do to celebrate? Oh, it's I mean it's a huge celebration, it, and it is one that that ripples through the business. I mean, right down to a brand new programmer fresh out of college because they really feel like their hard work is, has been recognized in the market. So it is one of those achievements that whether you're the CEO or whether you're the receptionist um, welcoming people into the office, you feel a very strong sense of pride and your customers feel the pride as well because they want to be with a solution provider that is recognized for vision and for ability to execute and driving their business for, you know, a number of years into the future. Love it, man. Uh, <laughs> Greg, what'd y'all do? Uh, I, I remember exactly where I was when we, when we got put in the leader's quadrant, we, mm -hmm. we first came in the niche quadrant. And then the next time around, we got to the leader's quadrant. And I remember where I was, I was in Singapore and we were trying to do business with a $40 billion retail conglomerate there. So I went to their CEO and said, <laughs> hey, and then I tried to book a flight to England to go give Tim Payne a big giant hug because <laughs> it, it, um, first of all, I really appreciated what he was doing as yeah. we talked about to try and shake things up and identify those companies that were really being innovative. Um, and it, and it felt like a whole lot of work as Corinne said, but, mm. uh, but instead I wound up in Germany and then Norway <laughs> doing user conferences, but uh, almost got there. Awesome. All right. So I love that. So much good stuff there. Mm. I, I love that note we wrapped on. So Kelly, as we move into our final story, we're going to tackle today. This is a really neat one. Uh, tell us more, Kelly. Yeah, so last week, uh, NASA renamed their DC headquarters mm -hmm. building after Mary Jackson, who was one of the women profiled in the movie Hidden Figures. Um, so if you've seen the movie, um, her character, she's the one, she starts as a computer, a, you know, computer, um, and she moves her way over to the engineering side of things. And in order to get there, she had to do some amount of coursework. In order to do that coursework, she had to publicly petition a city to allow her to take classes at a segregated high school before she could complete the coursework and get the promotion. And 
she pushed ahead and she completed it. And not only did she become the first African-American female engineer at NASA, um, there were hardly any other women engineers at the time. So yeah. she was sort of a, a double trailblazer. And the legacy of what these women achieved, if you have not seen the movie, you you have to see the movie. Absolutely have to see yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. It's a good one. Their legacy is amazing. You know, right up to this day, you know, my daughter's 12 um, and she watched Perseverance land on Mars like it was her job. And she knew how many seconds and she knew the time frame, mm -hmm. and she knew the speeds and and she was sharing all that with us. And oh, well, is this part of a school assignment? No, I needed to see how it worked. And so to me, that is a legacy, right? What this honor that Mary has mm. had conferred upon her in the renaming of this building that passes down to my daughter, Anna, and countless women and minorities and people that are pushing boundaries. So I think it's, I think it's an amazing thing that they've chosen to recognize her in this way. Excellent. Wow. I you, you said it best, Kelly. I, I love when, when folks take news stories, they take movies mm. and they put it in the perspective of the impact it has on their family. Absolutely. And you shared the best example. I, I can't think of anything to top that. Um, I will say it, it, it is, it, it's, uh, it's a wonderful heartwarming thing to see all the recognition now, but it still reminds you just, man, you know, where, um, to go back and you and, and Greg, that's still what you said. You want to hug on folks because <laughs> they had to overcome so much yeah. needless hate and obstacles oh, and yeah. segregation and, yeah. and just think, and they didn't, they didn't stop to your point. Uh, they, they kept right on going. And, and also the, something that I learned here in the last few weeks and Kelly, you kind of referenced it is that folks that any, anyone that, that, uh, crunch numbers back in the fifties uh, and sixties in the earliest yeah. days of, of, of uh, technology were called computers. Yeah. That was a, a human term. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, such a great story, Greg, Corinne, anything that y'all want to offer up? Oh, th this is one of my favorite movies um, about, about the three central characters and what they overcame each in their own right to, to really drive value at NASA, whether it was making that first IBM computer work or the calculations on the uh, on the trajectory or the you know the first female black female um, engineer in NASA. I mean, all together at the same time, yeah. three friends, the same period. So um, I, I think it's just it's it's a wonderful, wonderful story, and this is a great tribute. I wish that it would have happened decades ago, but I'm glad that it happened today. And I'm glad right. that, you know, it happened in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because, you know, women in supply chain make up about 40% of the workforce for supply chain organizations. Yet when you look at the leadership in supply chain organizations, even today, only 15% are female. Mm. So we still have a long way to go to, uh, to really have parity um, across the board and just look at people by the value they drive, not, not their, their, uh, gender or their race, um, or even where they live anymore. Um, so lots and lots of opportunity, I think for equal representation, um, across all sectors in supply chain. Yeah. Well said, Greg. I just, uh, well, first of all, what a fantastic segue from black history month into Women's History Month, first of all. So, Kelly, brilliant catch there. Um, again, an incredibly inspirational story. I still, I'm envisioning the scene where she's walking all the way across her campus at work. Yes. Oh. Right? To where uh, to where she can do her work. And, yep. um, and uh, you know, I think it, the, the I, I think of the Cal Calvin Coolidge quote, which I can't come up with right now, but basically that, um, persistence, right, is uh, alone is omnipotent in determining success. And thank God for the people who I press know. forward in oppressive situations mm -hmm. to make these things happen. And, and I hope they stand as an inspiration for people, some of whom feel so helpless and hopeless right now, to see that one single person, mm -hmm. or even these three, yep. Yep. these three persons, can get together and do something so incredibly monumental. 
And, and they did it without uh, knowing they were ultimately going to be successful. It's not like they knew true. if I just push through, I'm going to have a building named after me someday. They right. did not know, but it didn't stop them from pushing on. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's Great critical. Point. Yep. Uh, um, but what well, even uh, as they made names for themselves and reputations, it, you know, it, it's uh, no secret that John Glenn specifically asked Catherine Johnson yes. to do yes. the, uh, the, the trajectory, trajectory yeah, calculation. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. So I uh, love it. Uh, I love that, that this, the movie is not just great from a, story, a historical standpoint, but it's just a great movie with, with wonderful actors and character actors. And mm. as uh, Andrea says, it's a very empowering movie. She, I truly love it. It shows us that anything is possible that women actually can be, can actually be engineers and fight for their dreams and shoot for the stars. Andrew, I would just add to that and win and do it and do it yep. and do it. Uh, I love that. Uh, let's see. Peter says, and she was faster than that first computer. Brilliant. That's right. Really it was. is the only word to use. And then Victor. There it is. So this is the quote from Calvin <laughs> Coolidge. Oh. Keep it cool with Coolidge. He, uh, Victor says, quote, <laughs> nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than un unsuccessful men with talent. Man, nothing is more common mm. than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent, as Greg said. The slogan, mm -hmm. press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Mm -hmm. Victor, right on the money. Thanks so much for sharing that. That's a great, man, that's the first time I've heard that. And Greg, I'm very Greg. proud to be a product of Calvin Coolidge Elementary School in Shrewsbury, oh, Massachusetts. Yeah, man, we've come full circle that's here. That's right. Yeah. I know. I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> we started with, wasn't the first story Title IX, right? And, and yeah. here we are. Through, that's so. right. Well done. Well, well done, Scott Luton. Well, yeah. hey, I can't take credit. Y'all, All y'all make this happen, of course. <laughs> and Victor and Peter and Andrea are right there and everyone else uh, with the comments uh, always bring it. Love that. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think of when I hear Calvin Coolidge, there's a scene in Andy Griffith, one of the episodes where um, <laughs> they, they say, everyone talks about the weather, but no one does everything about it. And they, and, and they <laughs> argue who said that Calvin Coolidge or Mark Twain or whomever, but nevertheless, um, what a mm -hmm. great Monday morning. I think we kind of, we touched on some news. We touched on some, some initiatives and, and some, you know, course of magic quadrant touched on some history and each of y'all shared some, uh, some personal, some gleanings into your personal family and, and business journey and teams and whatnot. And that, that makes that really, really neat to be a part of. So big thanks to all three of y'all, Greg, Corinne and Kelly, um, uh, before we swoosh Kelly and Corinne out, Greg, we've got to make sure folks know, are you, well, wait a second. I skipped right over. We're supposed to tackle this on the front end. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not failing on this Monday morning. So Corinne, when you're not producing excellent work and interviews here at Supply Chain Now, where do you spend your time? Tell folks what you do. Yeah, yeah. Happy to. So um, I have been in the supply chain and technology space for, uh, as uh, as Greg reminds me, for more than 20 years. We, we won't actually name the number, but more than 20 years. So uh, and I spearheaded Mark. strategy and marketing for a Gartner Magic Quadrant leader and an IDC Marketscape leader. Um, and I've helped nearly a thousand customers transform their businesses. But what I do today, in addition to being the host of Tech Talk Digital Supply Chain right here on Supply Chain Now, I am also an advisor and a virtual chief marketing officer for high growth business to business technology companies. So helping them identify their unique value propositions or introduce new product or uh, capturing customer success, um, just helping them get their message out into the marketplace in, a, in an impactful way. Awesome. Including yeah. supply chain now, if you haven't right. noticed our transformation <laughs> over the last few months. You By stole my thunder, Greg. You stole my thunder. Uh, I've I've been fortunate, no, Corinne. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't read the notes. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> we threw those out about twelve oh one. I don't know if there were notes on that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've known Corinne for as just about for as, as long as I've been in Atlanta, and we've yeah. we've been fortunate to to work on a variety of things together. But it really has been. It's like been spiking the football to be a part of this this journey with supply chain now, and and to 
to benefit from all of what Corinne just shared, all that experience and expertise to benefit here at Supply Chain. We wouldn't be where where we are today, and especially with launching this series and that series and this new relationship, that new, new, new relationship without Corinne Burson. So really appreciate what you do. Love Tech Talk, and you got to keep it coming. All right. Uh, Can I say thank you before you go to Kelly? Thank you. Sure. <laughs> thank you to you and the team because it's not just one person. It is a team effort. And there's a whole lot that goes on that Amanda is instrumental in making happen. And it would be disingenuous for, for me to receive all that praise. There's a whole team That's behind right. Supply Chain now. So thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And- it's just that we're contractually forbidden from announcing again what it is exactly. that Amanda is really involved in. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Wait, hey, it's thank coming. You. It's coming. She knows where to find us. So um, no more spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly Barner, uh, let's make sure folks know. I mean, from buyer's meeting point to art mm-hmm. of procurement to, to other initiatives and entities, where do you spend your time when you're not right here? Um, I spend my time, like you said, buyer's meeting point where I predominantly write art of procurement, where I serve as the general manager and do an awful lot of stuff behind the scenes. Um, But of course, dial P for procurement, my fabulous supply chain now live stream, which is the third to save every month. And my favorite project of all, one week a month now I get to host this week in business history, which is like the best of all worlds. It's everything I love (laughs) all together. And it's Eight hours of investment in a 12-minute podcast, but I love every minute of it. Wow. Um, and so the ratings for next week. The ratings spike once a month. I'm still trying to figure out exactly. <laughs> uh, Kelly is wonderful. It's a coincidence. Wonderful. <laughs> what causes that? Yeah, There's what, a what, pattern, pattern uh, recognition. It's really a little important. bit slow, but Kelly did a wonderful job. And uh, what you didn't mention is, is you've got a couple of uh, – um, uh, big books that have been very well received that you've, you've authored and co-authored. Uh, there's all kinds of things that, that you've know. been up to here lately. Keeps me out of trouble. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't well, know, Kelly. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, love Dal P. Love, we got our next show coming up here in, yes, here in we a do. few weeks. Uh, I think we have uh, Mondelez International. Quentin Roach mm-hmm. is their chief procurement yes. officer that will be joining us. So I look forward to grabbing some popcorn and a Diet Coke and watching Kelly and Quentin talk procurement leadership. So oh, really yeah. we're going to talk gluten-free Oreos. I can hardly wait. I'm very excited. <laughs> Who knew? Oh, what my. is the point of that? <laughs> well, hey, to everyone. Just as good. They do. They're amazing, which is kind of a bad thing, but they're amazing. <laughs> Make sure you connect with Corinne and Kelly. I think we've got their LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Uh, make sure you connect with them there. Check them out with what they, you know, what they do here, what they do out in the marketplace. And I promise you, you will not regret it. Won't, won't, won't want to miss a single thing. So big thanks to Corinne Bursa and Kelly Barner. We'll see you both soon. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Beep. <laughs> um, what a great show. Neat conversation. Love. Uh, had a bunch of great comments. I couldn't get to all of them. I know. Uh, Andrea says, hey, what a great way to start the weekend. Andrea, please correct me. Is it Andrea or is it Andrea? I always get Andrea. Is it Andrea? Okay. In Spanish always ah uh, with a. Ah, ah okay. Uh, let's see. David, great episode. Hey, David, you're not getting away that easy, my friend. We're going to be publishing that great conversation. You're not going to miss David's perspective. Um, it's from someone that has been spent a lot of time in the production environment, manufacturing world, on the floor, and variety of roles, you name it. You're not going to miss Davin's one-on-one with me. Uh, let's see here. Peter says, there's no I in team unless you color in the A. <laughs> That'd be a really fat I too, wouldn't it? <laughs> That's right. Well, hey, we've got a we've got an interview uh, coming up really soon with Peter Bollet as well. We're probably going to be publishing that next week. And Peter also says uh, his daughter as well, uh, Kelly Barner. Oh, celiac disease. Okay. Yeah, um, so the gluten-free Oreos are... Perfect. Yeah, I got you. We've got a family member as well that uh, that is impacted by celiac. So uh, gluten free has been a a way of life for a few years now. Um, So much good stuff. Uh, David says he just about got away clean. (laughs) All right. So, Greg, one thing, one thing before we wrap, what's your one favorite takeaway from today's conversation? 
this is going to be odder than usual, Scott, but my one takeaway is I want to, I want to make sure that people understand just how, how knowledgeable and how professional the people that they are interacting with on these shows are, even though we're having a hell of a lot of fun and there's a lot of laughter, these are people that get done and, and um, are true knowledgeable experts in supply chain, either supply chain marketing or procurement, um, technology, manufacturing. That's just on this show, by the way, this very episode. Mm. Um, and I, I think it, I think sometimes it can get glossed over because we do have so much fun at it because so many of us have been doing it, as Corinne says, for more than two decades. And I don't want to say it's easy for us, but we see the opportunity and we can we can accomplish a lot without having to be unnecessarily stern or stayed or stagnant and and can really have some fun with it because we know that we, that we can really impact businesses um, in a in a big big way and that's just fun i, I know right. that sounds geeky right but it's fun um, so I, I think that's an important thing for people to take away is this is there are no talking heads here. We will never, ever bring you a talking head. No cowboy hats, no cowboy, no cowbells. <laughs> Only people with real supply chain talent. They, they may wear a cowboy hat. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Love that. Uh, love, you know, so what had so many different fair parts, but, uh, and I didn't recall Kelly's daughter's name, but the image she, she painted tied to perseverance and, and, and how, not only the the level of engagement there, but the level of inspiration and motivation. That's a big part of NASA's value to our country and really the globe, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and with privatization of, of the space program, that's a good thing, right? Cause it, it will, it will fuel innovation, but to see NASA and, and see how, how well NASA is doing digitally and communicating uh, the mission and, and the different aspects of that, it, you know, I think a lot more daughters and sons and you name it are going to be inspired. And, and that's going to mean a whole nother generation of pioneers and trailblazers, regardless whether they're tied to space or not. Hopefully plenty, because we need, we need a lot more talent in that space program. But that was, that was my favorite part here today. Yeah. And I'm going to have to, when my three kids get home today, I'm going to have to sit them down and see who, who is most fascinated with what's going on today on Mars. And then whoever it is, uh, I'm again, get them on the horn with our resident NASA rocket scientist, Kevin, Kevin Jackson. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anna, Anna was, um, is Kelly's daughter. So we'll have to sit down and do a, do an interview with Anna as well. All right. So Greg, we are eight minutes over schedule here today. So much, uh, so much to cover. Thanks so much to everyone that showed up uh, in the what we call the cheap seats, the comments. There's nothing cheap about those uh, POVs that they were shared here today. So thanks so much, all of y'all. Big thanks, of course. Cheap seats where the real fans sit, right? <laughs> those right. are the people that know whether that that pitcher ought to be yanked out in the sixth inning. Oh, it's right around the corner, Greg. It's right around I the know. corner. Spring training has started. We're going to play real games in 30 days. Um, big thanks to Kelly Barner and Corinne Bursa and to Greg White and, of course, to Amanda and Natalie and Clay behind the scenes. Hey, want all of y'all to have a wonderful week. Do good. Give forward. Be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.